start with uh, today's lecture. I think uh, Marcelo already mentioned that uh, uh, we are running a, a zero tolerance uh, uh, policy on time simply because we have the time constraint from the camera. Uh, it's a little bit uncharacteristic of uh, either Marcelo or myself to be zero tolerance with time, but, uh, but let's try to make it this time for the three. Uh, weeks. Um, so what I want to do first is remind you a little bit of what we did yesterday and summarize in, in a few minutes. And then I'll get on to the, the next topic which is foundations, if you like, basics of quantum mechanics. Of course in the light of quantum information. So I want to give you enough material that we can then quantize what we talked about and go beyond that and, uh, and explore other topics. So if I, just, if I just restate a little bit what we... What are the things you need to remember? Um, uh, from yesterday. So there were really two basic quantities you need to know how to handle. And both of them are, are functions of a probability distribution. So we talk about random variables, something that, uh, that has, um, that has uh, certain probabilistic outcomes. Um, and of course, this notion already, in a sense, you know, I, I was saying yesterday how quantum mechanics is the appropriate theory to view, to view, um, to view information. I think you can also see it in a way that classical randomness is really only an apparent randomness. It's randomness, in a sense, due to lack of information, not due to intrinsically something fundamental in being random. And this is one of those big, uh, big changes introduced by by quantum mechanics in our way of of thinking about the universe. It's something I'll keep coming back to. So in some sense, the concept of information probably doesn't even make sense in classical physics because there is no randomness. Everything happens with unit probability, or it just doesn't happen in Newtonian mechanics. And that's also an interesting point. Um, anyhow, Shannon's, info, ignoring this fact, uh, Shannon's uh, information, I, I introduced Shannon's entropy so get used to this fact that, that sometimes people use the letter, I think H usually is used in classical uh, information and, and S was the one that von Neumann used in, 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 in quantum mechanics, but never mind, let's call it all S, uh, not to confuse these things. And basically once you're given a probability distribution, this simply is exactly the same formula um, that, that you would encounter in, in statistical mechanics. I mean, this is the entropy that you, that you maximize under constraint to get all sorts of distributions, canonical, microcanonical, ground canonical, and whatever else you do. So it's exactly the same, the same entropy. The, the important point I made is that this actually is the only choice if you take additivity into account. Additivity of independent uh, events is such a strong requirement that there is no other function that does the job for you. So that, that there's not that much freedom we have about it. Uh, and the second quantity was, was something that, this talks about a single probability distribution. But if you have Alice and Bob as, as, as a, a sender and receiver of information, then you have to talk about the sender's probability distribution and about receivers, which could be different. And then somehow we, ha we said that we have to introduce another quantity which is actually just a combination of, of different um, uh, entropies and this was called mutual information and this talks about how correlated the input and the output are. So how correlated is the message that Alice sends to the, to the, to the signal in a way that's received by Bob. And this was simply speaking, I wrote it in three different ways. But if you only want to use this formula, then it really is just the entropy of uh, x um, plus the entropy of y minus the total entropy of, uh, of x and y. So this is the one where you would have to talk about the probability uh, distribution of, of x being equal to some value um, i, if you like, and y being equal to some value j. That's the, that's the probability distribution. And I think I gave this very simple example of x and y being both bits, and then you have four possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and you have to give all of these probabilities. So it's a very simple stuff. And, and the, the, the crux of the whole thing is actually that this happens to be the channel capacity of a communication channel. So what channel did is he did, so this is all now really just uh, reciting what we did yesterday maybe slightly different you know I want to give you a slightly different version and I think the more angles as usual you see something from the, the better you will understand ultimately 
Um, so basically, if you think about each of these messages being sent with some, uh, with some probability, so here is a message 1, 2, 3, and so on, n. And, and now you've got, you've got some probabilities associated with this, which is like p1, p2, and so on, pn. This is analysis side. And then there is Bob's side. And, and again, let's assume that, let's assume that, uh, that there is no loss of, uh, loss, of this, uh, loss of bits along the channel. Uh, what I'm taking into account is the fact that one bit value can convert into another bit value. One message becomes another. If you're worried about the loss, you can always enlarge your, your space to make it bigger and to say that loss just represents a zero probability of going into something. So you can always extend this and capture the loss of bits as well if that's your, if that's your major worry and major source of noise. So now Bob receives something that I called, so this was the X distribution, Bob receives something that you call Y distribution and you know it has some um, probabilities that I called Q1, Q2 and whatever, Qn. And Shannon made the state, and, and of course the channel now is all the probabilities for the message 1 to end up as message 1. This is something we call P1 uh, dash 1, which means what's the probability that 1 is received if 1 is sent in the first place. And then you can, you can fill in the rest of the details. Then I give you the probability P1, 2 if you like, probably I should say 2, 1. If I, if I take, it doesn't really matter on the order as long as you follow the same order. What's the probability that if one was sent, two was received on the other side? And so on. So yeah, now you can see that each of these messages can end up in every other message, and that's an n by n matrix containing all of these p, i, j probabilities. And that's the full description of the channel. So I've got the input, I've got the channel, and I've got these output probabilities from the product of these two, if you like, if you use rules of ordinary probability. And that's everything there is to Shannon's uh, scenario. And now his statement is, providing you do not exceed this number, you can be within an epsilon, no matter how small epsilon is, in, in a sense within this guy, you can still communicate with unit, with unit probability. And, and I offer you his way of proving this, which is very satisfying to a physicist. Uh, like I said yesterday, well, probably no mathematician will ever buy this proof. And actually, yes, uh, at least a dozen of mathematicians proved it properly afterwards. So we know this is correct. But, but here is Shannon's logic. So what he really did then is he took, he said, let me try to calculate the probability of success um, for my communication. And I want to show you that I can drive it arbitrarily close to a unity, unit efficiency, in terms of success probability to get the message here with unit fidelity over there, that there is no misunderstanding. And the question is, what's the rate at which I can do it? And the answer is, of course, it's this guy, but I want to show you that. So the rate of success is really, if you think about single transmission, it's 1 minus the rate of failure. And what's the rate to fail? The rate of fa to fail is, is, is the number of all the instances in which you failed, if you like, it's the number of failures, divided by the total number of messages. And you know yesterday from, from our logic that these guys are going to be something like 2 to the power of the number of bits n times the corresponding entropy that we calculated from the law of large numbers. And, and, and effectively this then is going to be raised to the power of the rate at which you transmit. What's the, what's the no total number of transmissions that I do? So let's pretend that there is some rate. Let's pretend that I don't know that the rate really is this guy here, because that's what I want to derive now. So there is some rate, and the number of messages you have, if you have some rate r, is simply 2 to the number of bits in your message, the number of times you communicate times this rate r. It's again the same logic that we had yesterday when we talked about entropy without norms. And, and so what is the number of failures and what is the total number of messages? The total number of messages is simply the entropy, 2 to the n times the entropy of the input. We already did that calculation. That's the data compression. So this n here is nothing but 2 to the n times the entropy of x. How about failures? Well, with failures, I want to calculate all of those guys 
where this guy ends up being not itself at the end. So I have to know how many of these guys do I produce from number one, how many of them are basically number two, three, four, and so on. What's the number of sequences of that type? And again, from exactly the same logic, what you really see is that the number of sequences like that is 2 to the power of n entropy of x given y. So in a way, what I'm saying is, let's say I receive one of these guys, and now I calculate all of these x's that could be contributing to this y. Actually, only one of these guys is the right guy. The majority in the large limit is the wrong guy. And that's why I, I mean, you know, you can put plus or minus 1 if it makes you happier, but it makes no difference given that this is already an exponentially large number. Okay? Here is Shaman. You can see how hand waving this is. It's beautiful, right? There are no epsilons and deltas, and it makes us all very happy. Anyhow, now you ask yourself, now you say, still, this number is much smaller than the total number of sequences. So I'm treating this as a small number. So this has the form 1 minus x to some power alpha. And already Newton known, knew, of course, that, that to a good approximation, if x is small, this is the uh, binomial or whatever expansion, that this you can write as, as something like that, plus higher order terms, which we are not going to care about. Um, and, and from that expression, this really looks, uh, looks rather nice because it looks something like 1 minus and then it looks like um, 2 to the power n r, that's my alpha now, and then x is nothing but 2 to the power of n and then in brackets, actually I'm going to write it with a minus sign so that I deliberately get the mutual information inside. So if I put the minus sign there, I will get s of x minus s of x given y. This guy is the mutual information x between x and y. It's the same guy there. Okay? So this is the same as s x minus s x given y. Okay? And now I'm comparing the rate at which I'm communicating with the mutual information. So if you concentrate a little bit on this number here, this is r uh, minus the mutual information between x and y. Okay? And I'm going to look at the limit when n tends to infinity. So I'm looking at the, at the, at the large limit because I want to communicate for a long time. And that's, the, that's what I care about. That's the way I'm going to derive the ultimate capacity. So what this says is as long as this number is negative, no matter how small, so as long as r is the mutual information minus some epsilon, and I can make this as small as I like by making n as large as I like. Here is where epsilons and deltas come in if you want to make this nice and tidy as a mathematician, but of course we couldn't care less about these things. But the point is, as long as you don't exceed i, but you can get arbitrarily close to i, then this guy in the large n limit tends to zero, and therefore your probability of success tends to one. Easy peasy, right? So you'll be happy to know that the way I mark exams is exactly the way that I derive things. So you can be a bit more liberal and cavalier with mathematics in the same way that I am. Okay? So we are physicists after all. So this is what justifies that you can come arbitrarily close to the mutual information, but if you exceed the mutual information, then you can no longer control this guy, and you cannot achieve this rate of communication. It's all to do with the law of large numbers from the data compression we talked about before. Now I've just applied data compression to conditional entropy, to the channel capacity. That's all there is to this. This is this theorem that I call it uh, theorem number two, which says that when you have noise, then the rate at which you can communicate is maximally the mutual information, and that's known as the channel capacity. So basically, the capacity itself, if you really like to write it formally, is the maximum over all inputs of the mutual information between x and y. So basically, try to fiddle with these probabilities because the sender, Alice, frequency, frequently controls the, the input state, and you can fiddle with the probabilities and order them in any way you like so that you get the maximum out of your channel. That's it. That's, that's now information theory. There is nothing more to that. And then what I said really at the end of it is that we need to modify this quantity if, you, if we take into account quantum effects 
simply because quantum zeros and ones, if you like, in, in some sense are not always distinguishable. And that's the topic I want to really start uh, doing now. Um, so basics of quantum mechanics is really for today. Um, so I, I made a statement that quantum mechanics in some sense is, uh, is um, already phrased as an information theory. Although you may not learn about it that way, it really is much closer in spirit to, to some type of information than classical physics. Uh, this is, of course, not entirely true in the sense that classical physics um, is also phrased um, after some amount, so after Newton it took a little bit of time, but basically two people uh, in particular viewed it in terms of information. One was Laplace, and this is the guy who, of course, scared, scared the hell out of everyone by saying that if there was a being, or if you had um, all the information of all the positions and all the momenta of all the particles in the universe, then you can plug this in into Newtonian equations and you can derive all the future behavior of everything in the universe. So the universe becomes fully deterministic. Notice the way he phrases this. He really says, if you give me a vector with the position of particle number one, momentum of particle number one, two, so he's already starting to write it as a matrix. Uh, and, and he really, you can almost call it a catalog of information in the same sense that Schrodinger called the wave function a catalog of information. So you can view classical physics, it's just that it becomes very boring in the sense that it's fully deterministic. So this is this famous Laplace's demon who can see everything. And presumably it becomes very depressed because there's nothing, uh, nothing else to do in this universe. Um, the other famous demon is Maxwell's demon. This guy is a very happy demon. So the demon actually says this guy is a manic demon. Okay? So it could be the same demon as Laplace's, in which case it's manic depressive, because you can see both the funny side of the universe as well as the sad side of the universe. But the funny side of the universe, the nice one, is that if you give me the same information, I can actually violate the second law of thermodynamics if I'm the demon. So so Maxwell's idea was there is this tendency to, to disorder which depresses us all as much as determinism does, that's the other extreme. But actually if you really give me all the positions and momenta, I can somehow sort them out intelligently to get work out of complete equilibrium, complete mass, and this of course makes me ultra happy. I mean I can beat the aging process, I can reverse all of these things. So it's a really very, very happy uh, demon in that sense. So, these are the information theoretic formulations already of Newtonian mechanics and of thermodynamics. So of course people knew about it before as well. And actually the ultimate way of really looking about physics, if you want to talk about it very pragmatically, and that's the way that Heisenberg set out to think about it, in a very brutal uh, way of eliminating anything that should not really feature in your theory. So what physics is all about is, I think this is the nicest way of looking at it, especially that we talked about betting prior to this. So physics is all about predicting the future. It really is about sticking your neck out, having the chance and risking it or failing, and basically writing down the predictions that you have of the future experimental outcomes. It's just it's as simple as that. So what we do is we sit down, we write some predictions. Then of course if your experiment is going to take five hours to complete, you also have to know how to shift these predictions from t equals zero to t equals five hours. So you need to know the evolution of your system. But that only gives you the future catalog of information with all the possible outcomes. And now you go and do the experiment and you try to match them, does it make sense or not? So phys quantum physics in that sense is the best betting uh, catalog that we have. It's just, it doesn't get better than that. And it's a very, very simplistic way of, uh, of looking at quantum mechanics, but of course you can look at classical physics in, in exactly the same way. So that's the name of the game. How well can I predict, uh, predict future behavior? And of course the punchline will be that quantum catalog of information becomes very, very unusual compared to this uh, list of uh, positions and, and momenta. So it's really a nice way of looking at, uh, at quantum mechanics. So here is, I'll give you the postulates according to uh, According to me, in some sense, well, these are the postulates. I mean, if you open a random book on quantum mechanics, you will find everything between 3 and, and 23 different postulates of quantum mechanics. But there are really only four postulates of quantum mechanics. Actually, there are five, but I will probably not tell you about the fifth one because we won't need it 
in this course. Or I will tell you about it when we get to need this time. So the first one tells you about the state. You see, it becomes very natural. If you think about the catalog of betting, then what you need to provide for me is really the information about your system, which actually we call the state of the system. And this guy happens to be a vector. So states uh, or, or, or betting catalogs are, are vectors. And there is this, of course, famous thing that they are complex. Um, so when I was taught quantum mechanics, the person said, postulate number one is the superposition postulate. There is no superposition postulate in quantum mechanics. It's a consequence of this guy. This is much cleaner way. You don't have to list all the properties because it's already captured if you talk about the vector space. Because what this says is that when I sum up two vectors, I get another vector. And if I already told you that there is an identity between states and vectors, then you've got the superposition encoded in the vector structure. And that's why we use vectors, actually, because we know that these guys interfere. This contains that stuff already. I'll, I'll justify these things even more as we go along. This, by the way, I will also contradict in probably half an hour time, because states are not really vectors. They're a little bit more than that. And that's what I want to teach you. I want to go beyond this, this kind. So even this will be wrong. So prepare yourself for all of this. Now, what about observables? Again, the, 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 the issue is that you don't really observe vectors in, in, in real world. You just get some numbers out of your, of your experiments. And then, and then when it comes to observables, this is all nice and simple for most of you because you've done it. It's just that it may, the notation may get a bit different now from what you are used to. And that's what I want to try to get uh, across today. So observables are operators. Um, and of course, operators are really matrices if you think, well, they happen to be Hermitian operators, and you all know about it as well. But, uh, but basically, these are matrices. And, and um, I mean, most of you know probably why, why this is like this and how we encode these things. And, and we will see again this when we, when we practice various things. But, but even this, this statement sounds a little bit uh, abstract in many ways. So, so the, question, the question is really how do I get experimental predictions out of this? So now I've given you, I've given you uh, catalogs of information. This is my betting on the best uh, prediction for the outcomes. Now I've given you what I'm going to measure position, momentum, energy, and whatever else. And, and now I have to tell you how I get the results out, because I don't measure matrices either in the real world. No one measures matrices. So I really measure numbers. And the question is, how do I get a number out of that? And of course, most of you know that this is, this is the most infamous postulate of quantum mechanics, the famous Born rule. So some people believe that there are three postulates, by the way, not four. This one is superfluous. That's called the many worlds interpretation. There's a lot to be said about all of these things as well. That's interesting. But anyway, Born rule says, when you measure one of these guys with this operator, then the probability for your outcome, or the average value of the operator is given. So basically, the average value of the operator. I'm also going to, people frequently put hats on quantities. You will see as we go along that I will get so lazy and tired that I'm going to go into the minimalistic thing. Everything is going to be ultimately an operator and quantum mechanics, so we, I don't even care about these things. This guy is going to be an inner product. I'll, I'll say a bit more about this, between the operator and the state itself. So this, this guy will be labeled as, as some, some object like that. And I will have to say a little bit more about this type of notation. So that's the rule to say the average value of your observable you can compute in some way that's written like that. Again, don't worry too much. I just want to summarize the rules at first. And the last rule is the one really that tells you about the temporal evolution of your predictions. So what if you're not doing the experiment now, but someone asks you what's going to happen in three hours' time? Then, of course, you need to know how your predictions change with time. And, um, you know, in, in in ordinary quantum mechanics, which is again most of the stuff we'll be doing here, you talk about the Schrodinger equation. Um, so this tells you about the evolution and how to evolve your state and how to get a state at some 
later time t. And this simply says, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice and simple differential equation which we are going to debate a little bit as well. It says that if you give me something at time t, then you have to uh, basically hit it with this Hamiltonian, which then generates, uh, so this Hamiltonian is also an operator, uh, which then generates the evolution of your system. So when we talk about implementations in particular, we'll have a lot to say. Again, most of you probably know all of this and have worked with this before. Here, the post, there are no other postulates of quantum mechanics. The fifth one that I, that I don't want to mention now is really about particle statistics, fermions and bosons. You really need it. It's an independent postulate as far as we know. But in normal relativistic quantum mechanics, no one really cares about it too much. Um, so, so now the question is, let me motivate this a little bit so I just get you used to this because probably, some, I mean, all of you certainly are familiar with quantum mechanics, with wave functions and so on, but maybe some of you have not seen this kind of stuff, so at least I want to do some things with, with these guys. So, so when you talk about, for example, a two-level atom, then, so you talk about two different energy levels, really energy one and energy two. Quantum mechanically, you would associate two vectors with these kind of guys, and, and, and the vector notation is really much, much more convenient because you don't have to worry about the space and time dependence. This somehow hides the fact that your system evolves in space and time. And in fact, it makes space and time of secondary importance. Quantum mechanics really lives in Hilbert spaces, uh, and it doesn't care about space-time. That's a really interesting curiosity, but it makes it, of course, more difficult to talk about relativity within this context. But anyway, here is a vector 1, and here is a vector 2 corresponding to these, uh, to these states. So the, not, the reason why they are written like this is because of a guy called Dirac, who actually, um, who actually realized that when he was talking about how distinguishable these guys are, he could simply bor borrow the notion of inner product from, um, from mathematics. And basically the, the statement is, is that the inner product of these guys is written as this bracket. Um, so, you know, being a physicist, Dirac uh, couldn't spell. So he missed this C out and he called this guy bra and this guy cat. And these are the bras and cats that I think all of you know about. So, so this is again what no sane mathematician would do. Because in mathematics, this bracket is a number. That's one single thing. And Dirac said, why don't I actually split it into, into bras and into cats? It's an insane thing. It corresponds. Uh, to the usual joke where sine x divided by x is simply sine. You cannot do that. Okay? I mean, you can, obviously, as a physicist. But as a mathematician, you'd be very reluctant to be as cool as this. Okay? So the rock was cool. Uh, now, um, these guys really are conjugates of each other. They are emission conjugates of each other. And they play a very important role when we talk about excitations and de-excitations and the dynamics. So this was crucial. Incidentally, if you're thinking about other ways of combining these guys, you really can put them on top of each other like that as well. So Dirac was very creative in shuffling the brackets all the way around. This is called the Dirac spinner, if you like. So all of these things exist, and, and I think he really uh, uh, played a lot around when, uh, when he was discovering these things. So, if you really talk about two different energy levels or two different polarization states of light, like vertical and horizontal, then we know in practice, so you see I'm going to do it the other way around, I'm going to motivate this physically. We know in practice that we can discriminate this with unit efficiency. And what this means is that the overlap between these states has to be equal to zero. So that simply says, experimentally I can in principle tell you with 100% efficiency whether I'm in this state or that state. Okay? In atomic physics, you can do this with more than four nines accuracy. You can move it from state one to state two with 99.99% fidelity. This is really unbelievable, actually. That's a good one. So we know that we can really approach this in practice. Um, so these are, these are, these are so-called orthogonal states. And this would correspond just in case you you, you just have a, a simple um, um, wave mechanics in mind, this would correspond to this kind of uh, overlap integral. So now we don't have to integrate. I, I, I really don't like integrating. It's too complicated. And if you don't like it, then you would really love 
uh, Dirac's way of, uh, of talking about stuff. You have to just be able to add things up, like 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2 square root 2, if you talk about those inequalities and those things. So, so here, here is this, uh, this, uh, this thing, and, and, and then the postulate says any other combination of uh, psi 1 and psi 2 the unusual thing is that these guys are complex. So this is this complex uh, vector space. Um, any combination is also a legitimate physical state. And now you can talk about overlaps between, between a state like this and a state psi 1, for example. And you will see, of course, that the overlap is equal to alpha. It's not 0 in general if alpha is not 0. And this is what, as soon as you see that it's not zero, this means in practice that you cannot discriminate these guys with full efficiency. So again, I'm sure you all know this, and I think this is something that I mentioned earlier, why it's beneficial to communicate with non-orthogonal states. So this is something we'll be doing uh, very shortly, basically. So any state of this type is, uh, is allowed. When it comes to operators, what operators really do um, is tell you how to move from one state to another. So this is a way, again, the way that, uh, that probably I want to erase this stuff uh, and to show you this. Again, the way that Iraq uh, used this. Um, so mathematically speaking, you really, if you want to tell me how uh, psi 1 at some stage becomes psi 2, then the thing that achieves this transformation is what you call an operator. So anything that maps a function into any other function or a vector into any other vector is actually formally known as an operator. It's as simple as that, as general as that. It's just that Dirac had a fun way of writing these guys. Okay? So Dirac said, well, if I, if I really now separate bras and cats, why not put them back to front? And so Dirac would say, if you really want something like that, then the best way to write it is in, in this backwards notation. Not as an inner product, but as an outer product, uh, for obvious reasons. So basically, um, uh, uh, basically, why does this do the job? And the reason is that if you use this as your operator O, if you like, then if you multiply psi 1 by this, and use the usual rule of inner product, you will just get simply psi 2 out of it. So the evolution in quantum mechanics is written very much uh, like uh, uh, the Hebrew or any Arabic language. It goes from right to left. So state psi 1 goes into state psi 2. And you can continue this logic ad infinitum. It goes in the wrong direction if you have the European tragedies in mind. Um, now, um, so why is this so? Now a mathematician would tell you when you have something like this, rule number one is you can erase the bracket. For a physicist, we tend to do this even without any rules. I mean, that, that makes sense to do. And then you, you, know, you, you say, well, this is exactly the inner product that you were telling me about. And now you say the inner product of the state with itself has got to be equal to one. I mean, there's a 100% overlap there. There's just a normalization, in other words. And if this is equal to one, then of course what I'm left with is psi two. So here is really a beautiful way of, of capturing operators. It, it takes you from psi 1 to psi 2. That's all there is to quantum mechanics, really. So that's what the end. And you can now generalize this. You can say, hey, I'd love something that also sends at the same time phi 1 to phi 2. No problem. Just add it to this operator. Just, just do exactly the same. And you can construct every operator in exactly the same, the same way. So this is this Dirac. How many of you are familiar with Dirac notation? Just out of curiosity. Most. Excellent. Excellent. Brilliant. So basically, so we can really move quickly. So this is, this is, the, this is simply the uh, justifying observables and the way we write these observables. And then the question comes of this Born rule. So, so, so the logic is now, I don't observe uh, vectors, but I definitely also don't observe things like this in reality. There's no way to measure and get this outcome uh, uh, in your experiment. And so the question is, how do I convert this into a number? So first of all, how do I convert the outer product into inner product? So I'd love to be able to go from psi phi into psi phi. This already is a number. It's a complex number, so that's not also what I want, which is why the Born rule comes in and says you should really take mod square of it. That gives you the probability to discriminate the two guys. And that's really the number you can measure if you repeat your experiments. So 
So this guy is just a mod square to get a real number. This guy is an operation called a trace. And you will never understand this if you do a formal course in mathematics because the trace is the sum of the diagonal elements of a matrix. Does that look like that to you? It does if you think a little bit about it, but this is a much more, this is the physics -y way of doing stuff. So basically, I need something that converts funny operator into, into a number, and actually the trace is exactly what does this thing by definition. It's the definition of, of trace. And, uh, and, and so now, so now we have, we have some, somehow justified, uh, justified these rules. And then, of course, now you have the Schrodinger equation. And we will play with that, uh, we will play with that uh, a lot. I just want to make one comment about it. Again, most of you probably know about it anyway. Um, there's not, uh, we don't need to elaborate too much on that. Um, we'll probably work in the regime um, in, which, in, in which case the Schrodinger equation is going to be very, very easy to solve. So basically what we want to do is we are given some Hamiltonian uh, to start with. And Hamiltonian you can construct in exactly the same way as you're constructing your operators. Hamiltonian is an operator, and it says that the level number one has energy E1, and level number two has energy E2. So when Hamiltonian multiplies psi1, I've got to get E1 times psi1, and when it multiplies psi2, I've got to get E2 times psi2. And this already tells you how to write it in an operator form, because basically the operator that does the job is E1, Psi1, Psi1, E2, Psi2, Psi2. And if you use the same logic as I did on the previous slide, so to speak, then you can see that if I multiply this state by this uh, entity, this guy will give you zero because of the inner product between one and two being zero. This one guy will give you one, and all that will survive is E1 times Psi1, which is exactly this guy. You can test the other guy. Here is your Hamiltonian of your two-level system. Again, if you have n levels, you can add them all up in exactly the same way. You see how naturally it is to teach quantum mechanics like this. I have no idea why we do wave functions over and over again. There are probably two books only, two good books only that start in this way. One is definitely Feynman, I think. The other one depends on your choice, I suppose. But Feynman, I think, is a really good book. It starts defining stuff in this way. It really is the most natural way to talk about stuff. So now, once you give me this Hamiltonian, you can, you can then shove it into the Schrodinger equation, and you can solve the Schrodinger equation, and you can see how the state evolves in time. And as you know, there will be some precession frequencies depending on these energies divided by h bar and so on. So I don't want to go into too much detail now because we'll talk a lot about quantum gates later on. One comment I want to make is that I think most of the time, if not all the time throughout this course, we'll talk about time-independent Hamiltonians. If you have, if you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, you're in serious trouble usually, and no one knows how to solve the Schrodinger equation. We, we, we know how to solve the Schrodinger equation analytically only in, in maybe two or three cases, and I think each of them is a Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, and you could have got it yourself if you were born 100 years ago. Okay, it was as easy as that. Rabi flopping is one of them, I think, that most of you can know about. Anyhow, if you have time dependence, so if you have time independent equation, then you can really treat this as a first order partial differential, par, uh, just differential equation, which means you can just invert this guy and exponentiate your Hamiltonian. And we would write something like psi at time zero when multiplied by i Hamiltonian t divided by h bar. I'm just inverting the equation as if this psi was a number. And this would be your psi at time t. So the catalog at time t, all your information about the system at t, is related to information at zero by this transformation, which is what we call a unitary transformation. And it comes from the exponential of your Hamiltonian. It's very easy to do that. Yeah, so again, if you think of this Hamiltonian as a matrix, you may well be asking yourself, how do I exponentiate the matrix? What does it mean to exponentiate the matrix? And we will talk about these tricks later on as well. It's not obvious. Um, but what I want to warn you against is that if you have time dependence here, then you've got two different cases. One of them is easy, and you can do exactly the same thing as this. The other one is actually impossible, in a way. So the easy one is when when the Hamiltonian at every instant in time commutes 
I'll explain this a little bit. Commutes with, with any other instant in time Hamiltonian. So if it's a time dependent Hamiltonian, but actually the basis in which you write this Hamiltonian is always the same. Then the solution formally is the same as this guy. This operator then becomes uh, the integral of your time uh, dependent Hamiltonian dt. And it's exactly the same logic. Okay. So you, you really can treat, you know, when you have when you have commuta co commutation, then basically these guys behave like numbers. That's the intuition. And you can treat them like numbers. There is no problem. If you have time, time, if, if these guys don't commute, then you have a trouble. You cannot really sum them up as this integral. And the simple reason for that is that for some reason, that may be immediately obvious to a mathematically minded person, but certainly completely baffles a physicist when you see this, is that the product of two exponentials of two operators is not the same as the exponential of the sum of these guys. Only when they commute is the same. Why is this like this? I have no idea. God knows why. I can write it down. I can show you that it is like that. But it's just uh, it's something that makes our life very difficult. And then we go into perturbation theory. So this one doesn't have the analytic solution. But fortunately, when we talk about quantum information, what we will always do is we will talk about a certain instance in time during which one Hamiltonian acts. This is like one gate. And then we will have another gate with some other Hamiltonian, but during this time period, this guy will be constant and this guy will be constant. So we'll be able to evolve the system for a little while, then evolve it for a little more with another Hamiltonian and so on, which is effectively like doing perturbation, actually. That's how you cheat when you have a non-commutativity in your Hamiltonian. It's just a very small remark to bear in mind. I think the best thing now to do is really to, uh, to make a 10-minute break, and then I will come back and start to apply some of these things to information theory. So can I assume that all of this so far is very familiar and Easy peasy, basically. Is that, uh, is that a good assumption? Okay, that's going to be the working hypothesis. I'm going to be a little bit faster than um, in 10 minutes' time. Can I start? Okay, very good. Uh, I think there was a question, just, just a brief question that I want to touch upon because it may be interesting uh, to elaborate on this last issue of. How do we treat uh, time, time dependent stuff? Very briefly, is that if, if you really have the Schrodinger equation with the time dependent Hamiltonian where things don't commute, then what we do is, uh, is we look at, we look at, we basically start at time zero and then we expand the, the system for a very brief amount of time, delta t, and then continue to expand it to the next delta t interval and so on. So if you want to talk about the evolution in a long time interval t between the initial and the final state, you break this interval into lots of small evolutions. They're small enough that you can say that the Hamiltonian is so how small is small? Again, something that baffles mathematicians. Uh, delta t goes to zero, it's infinitesimal, but not zero and all sorts of nonsense like that. To a physicist, small just means small compared to the overall rate of the evolution of the system. So you can assume that the Hamiltonian here is some Hamiltonian, but it's constant during this first period. The next one is some other Hamiltonian, it changed, but it's constant. It's really like gate, what I was explaining. And then you've got some last Hamiltonian HM. So I, I give you the initial state, okay? Then I hit it with the evolution operator H1T. I don't have to worry about anything here because there is no commutation issue, it's constant in time. Then I hit it with the next evolution from, from this state to the next delta t interval, which is just I A, you know, H2 over H bar and so on. Okay? Now, because this is a very small, sorry, it's delta t times delta t time. Because delta t is small, what I can do is I can expand each of these as 1 minus you know, it's again the, the Taylor expansion. I H1 delta T over H bar is the first bit. The second bit is 1 minus I H2 delta T over H bar 
and then 1 minus i h n delta t over h bar. Okay? And, and now you say, well, what's the contribution? Let's just multiply them all out. There are two to the n terms here. Identity times identity times identity times identity is the, is the zero order, if you like. So there is identity. Nothing happens to your state. It stays the same. I mean, that's intuitively clear that to the zero order, nothing happens. What's the first order? <coughs> I have to bunch all of the terms where I collect the Hamiltonian, multiplying the identities everywhere else. So there will be something like uh, I delta T over H bar, and then there will be Hamiltonian 1 plus Hamiltonian 2 plus Hamiltonian 3 and so on, plus Hamiltonian N. And now I will have all the terms with two Hamiltonians, Hamiltonian I, Hamiltonian J, you know this is of the order that, 3, and so on. And if you've done this in 1945, you would be faster than Feynman and you would get again a Nobel Prize for, for physics because what you're doing is really Feynman type diagrams. So you're saying, you know, your system evolves from 0 to n without any, any perturbation, then it gets hit by a single Hamiltonian at some time whenever, which, whichever of these guys acts, then it gets hit by two Hamiltonians and I have to sum up all of these guys. They're known as Feynman diagrams. It's just a very fancy way, uh, part integration of talking about something as boring as this. Yeah, it's very boring. And, and this some of you may have seen as, as, as basically if I take the continuum limit and I pretend that I've really divided it into infinitesimal intervals, this will be uh, minus i over h bar integral of the Hamiltonian times dt. Okay, that's the first order. That's the Fermi's golden rule. Okay, if you like, for those of you who know about it. So times the second order and so on. That's how you do this. So you break it up into such small bits that you don't have to worry about commutativity. And then the question is how good a mathematic, how good a number cruncher are you? How high up do you need to go and how high up you can go? I know some people who go to the sixth order. Okay, so that's how good some analytic, not, a, not with a computer. Most of the rest of us, I guess, stop at the, at the first order or maybe second. So that's, that's what you have to do there, but we'll never have to do this in this course. Now I'm going to tell you what I, what I promised, which is that these rules are wrong. And now I will tell you the real rules of quantum mechanics. Okay? Um, So that's actually uh, probably uh, something that may be new to, to at least some of you in the audience. Um, of QM. So these really are the final rules, I'm honest now, okay? As, as far as we know. So number one is really that the states are not vectors, but they are matrices themselves, they're operators. So states of systems, you'll see in a minute why we need to do that. And actually, Shannon's scenario of communication provides a perfect motivation for why I need to do the thing that I'm doing now. So states um, are uh, operators actually. So we've upgraded vectors into operators. Now they look like, like operators, they don't look like vectors anymore. So previously you'd be saying here is my state. Now you're actually saying no, that's my state. And you will see why we need to go into a notation like that to, to actually do quantum mechanics problem. Um, and, then, and then actually, um, the, next, the next statement is the same in a sense that observables uh, um, are still um, operators. So if, in, in a way, you're now treating the states on an equal footing with, uh, with, uh, with operators. So still, you will be using some object of this type. Then the Born rule um, becomes um, becomes actually written in a very nice and unified form which shows you that, that there is a certain equivalence between the operators and the states. Uh, you really can interchange between them. And even when you talk about evolution, and here I was evolving states, you could equally well evolve operators in fixed states. And this, most of you will know, is the Heisenberg picture of, of quantum mechanics. So the Born rule ends up being the trace. So the average of an operator is just the trace of that operator times this uh, density matrix, which I just want to shorten to, to some letter, Greek letter rho. So we tend to use uh, Greek letters there uh, to make it more impressive. It always looks cooler when you use Greek letters. It's just much more sophisticated than the Latin ones. 
Anyway, so, so the number four rule then becomes much more generalized. And actually, that's another jump that you have to make if you haven't seen that. Evolution of your system. And, and here I have to say a few, a few things about it. Actually, this, 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 this is a non-trivial statement. Evolution, in fact, it's so non-trivial that, that it's still debated in many circles, uh, especially heavy practitioners of, of this kind of stuff in complex systems, in fields like solid state or chemistry even, they, they tend to actually disagree with some of these statements that I will make now. And that's really interesting. It gets much more interesting. So evolution is uh, uh, completely, in general, the most general evolution of your system is not just a Schrodinger equation, but it's actually a completely positive, I have to explain um, each of these terms and I will, completely positive trace uh, preserving um, map. Um, some people like to call it a super operator because previously I said operators are quantities that map vectors into vectors. But now I have to talk about the state of my system as, a, as an operator already to start with. So I have to basically tell you how to change an operator at time zero to an operator at time t. I'm no longer changing a vector and using an operator. And you could easily see how uh, uninvented we are in that we call these guys super operators. So it's something that acts on an operator to give you another operator, so it's got to be better than an operator, and it's a super operator, okay? So this CP map, this completely positive uh, trace-preserving map is also known as a super operator. Simply because it acts on operators. You need something of higher order, and, and I will show you how we write these guys as well. So there is a formalism for that. So this guy is this CP map. So the most general way of mapping something that's an allowed physical state into an equally allowed different physical state is actually this guy. There is nothing more general than that. That's a statement I'm making, and I think we are relatively confident about these things, but again, there are certain intricacies there when you start to discuss, discuss um, details of these things. So let, 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 me, let me start explaining this. So that, that's, that's, that's the way it is now in quantum mechanics. Um, so, uh, why operators? And the need for operators really arises immediately if you couple, in a way, the classical uncertainty I was talking about uh, with, uh, this, uh, there's an awful lot to be said about this, and like I said, really feel free to interrupt me and steer me in any direction that you think is the, is the one you feel you should, you should mo know more about. There's, there's really an awful lot about this. So now, why operators? And somehow the operator is justified in a way that vectors tell you about the quantum uncertainty. They, they tell you that you can have states which are not fully distinguishable, which is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, if you like. But what if on top of it you have a classical uncertainty about the, the state of the system that you have? Uh, so it's not a superposition, but it really just is that you lack information whether the, your experiment created the right state or whether there is a certain probability that it created some other, some other state. And this is very much the scenario that, that we had in communication. And actually that's, that, that was the first thing that was analyzed. So people who were, who were 20 years ahead of, ahead of the whole field of quantum information. And I'm talking about people like Hellstrom, there was a guy called Holevo, and there were a few other people in the 70s, in late 60s, early 70s, who actually thought about these problems. Um, they, they, they phrase it in the, in the communication scenario. So again, if you think of Alice um, getting out uh, two bits, zero and one, with some probability, but now deliberately choosing to encode them as different, um, as different quantum mechanical states, psi zero and psi one, and these guys don't need to be orthogonal in general, then actually, if you say, how do I describe that state now? Um, so Alice tosses a coin. She has a two-level system in front of her, if you like. And if she gets heads, she prepares state size zero. And if she gets tails, this is really a classical process in some sense. I mean, there is no classical process, by the way, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm pretending that there is a classical mechanics out there, and it's genuine. So basically, here is a classical process. And then if you get one outcome, you prepare one state. If you get another outcome, you prepare another state. 
The question is how should I describe this quantum mechanically fully to take into account this, this extra uncertainty? Because now this state is what Alice uh, sends to Bob. And basically Bob says, I've still got one physical system. I know that Alice was a little bit careless as to which of these two states she prepared. She kind of didn't tell me whether it's psi 0 or psi 1. So I'm receiving an object that I have to treat somehow and make some measurements, make some predictions as to the outcomes and so on. So how do I do that? And, and the way to do that really is to say that the thing that travels to Bob, so that's where it, it's absolutely essential that you upgrade each of these guys into matrices. So you're really thinking of this guy as a, as a matrix. You're thinking of that guy as a matrix. And then all you do is take an average of these guys in the same way that you would average anything classically. So basically your row would be with probability p, I've got the state psi 0. And with probability 1 minus p, I've got the state um, psi 1. Okay? Why does this make sense? So I've kind, of, I've kind of postulated the solution of something. But if you want to go backwards and see how to make this consistent, what you're really doing is making it consistent with the Born rule, Born postulate here. And, and that actually comes already of the wrong formulation of quantum mechanics, the baby formulation, not, not so serious one that we had before. So if you're in a pure state, and if you say that, that the average of some operator is given like that, that's the number that tells you the average value if you repeat your experiment a uh, zillion number of times. And so this is a number, a real number. And, and if you have the average for state psi 1, and quantum mechanics tells you that this is your rule, why is this the rule? Don't question this. These are the rules of quantum mechanics, OK? These are the postulates. So no one knows any deeper reason. That's also why it's interesting to go into quantum information, because lots of people are trying to derive these postulates from quantum, uh, from information theory. So there is, no, there is no answer to why this is the way it is. Okay. Uh, there is again another of those Feynman stories where he was asked, you know, where does the Schrodinger equation come from? And he said it comes from Schrodinger's head. And this really is the way it is in science. There is no other. It just works in practice. I mean, that's where it comes from. Now, if I have one number and I have another number and I'm not certain, I have a certain probability that I got this number and certain other probability for this number, what's the average result that I'm going to get? What I should really get is p times this number, 1 minus p times that number. It's just a classical probability theory of averaging over numbers with some probability distribution. And if you think that that should be encoded into the trace rule, and if you work backwards, then this simply has to be written as trace of your operator times a quantity that looks like p times psi 0 plus 1 minus p times psi 1. Okay? Why? Because trace of an operator times this state here, if you look at just the first bit, first of all, this is just a number. It comes out. And secondly, what I said is that the trace rule converts an outer product into an inner product. So this guy here is nothing other than this. And you can do the same with this guy, and you will recover the average formula that I claimed initially. So if you go backwards, you can see immediately how you have to construct the state of your system if you have a classical uncertainty on top. QED, that's why we do it. That's the only reason. Okay? And again, if you say, why are you trying to conform to this rule? Because it's been successful for 100 years. That's the, only, that's the cheap way out that we have in physics. So whenever we don't understand something, we elevate it to a postulate. And that's it. I hide behind it. It's a postulate. I mean, come on. Don't ask me about it. Okay? Of course, I'm making fun of it. And of course, we do question that. And that's the whole fun of science. So now, what I, what I want to do, so somehow it justifies why we do things like that. And then it conforms um, to this kind of thing. And now I want to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about, um, about the, the evolution of, of, of the system. But actually, to close this line of, uh, line of thinking, which I, which I will come back to, uh, and hopefully I think I will, I will be able easily to do that uh, tonight, is now Bob has a task. So Bob knows this. This is a given thing in the same way 
the, the probabilities in classical communication theory are given. You just know that Alice is using the English language and the letter E comes up more frequently with whatever frequency and A with some other. This is given. There is no, you, you're not trying to estimate that. The alphabet is, is known, the probabilities are known. So the density matrix that comes to Bob is known. But he actually doesn't care about the density matrix. He wants to know whether Alice is going to go out to a dinner or cinema with him tonight or not. Is she going to set him yes or no? But now she's encoding yes or no in a very ambiguous way. So there is a maybe possibility as well in quantum mechanics. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty translated to this name. Now, so he has to say, ah, OK, what I have to do is I have to make a, as you see how this matches real life much more than classical physics. So there's a, uh, at least in my case, I don't know how it is with you. Anyhow, in, um, in, in this case, Bob has to say, ah, now I can make a measurement. And of course, when we talk about measurements, this is part of this evolution here. This is the completely positive thing that you can do to your system. And I'll motivate it uh, as we go along. You already know about projective measurements. This is not a mystery to you. I just want to upgrade them a little bit more. So basically, what Bob has to say is, now I'm allowed to perform a measurement. I can construct whatever I like that conforms to rule number four. But all I want is something with two outcomes. If I get outcome zero, I'm going to predict that Alice sends psi zero. And if I get outcome one, I'm going to predict that Alice sends psi one. This is the famous problem that I think Hellstrom and Holleber looked at. I think this was late 60s, like I said. And they really said, what's the best way of discriminating between two non-orthogonal states um, if I know the probabilities with which they occur? And that's how you maximize the channel capacity. So now the channel capacity becomes the best rate of estimating your state. I'm still not talking about the Shannon equivalent because I'm talking about one single entity being sent. What you would do in reality is you would wait for n communications. You would wait for Alice to say no, 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 definitely no, and so on, yes, maybe, and so on. And then you would try to do the best estimate of that with a collective measurement of all of these n quantum bits. And that actually can be much more efficient than measuring them one at a time. But it's also interesting to know what happens when you do one at a, one at a time. And it's much easier one to understand than the, than the next one that I'm going to talk about. So, so that's basically the end game. And that turns into your data compression in, uh, in quantum mechanics. And I would derive the noiseless data compression very easily in exactly the same way that we did Shannon data compression and got the entropy to be. So now I would derive the quantum entropy. That's how that's going to Okay. But before I do that, let me say a, a few words about these CP maps. If, if, you, if you miss something um, from today's lecture, well, obviously you have the video and you can rewind back and, and listen to it again. But if the point is even then not clear, which most likely will not be, what you sh should really be um, doing is, is waiting for the examples that we are going to be covering. Because from now on, all I'll be doing is using these kind of postulates over and over again in different scenarios. So even if you're not completely certain about what I'm saying through practice, I think you will get to know uh, how this really works. So what are these CP, what are these CP maps? Um, OK. So density matrix. Um, um, So this row is really what's known as a density matrix. This is the state of your system. Again, matrix, it's nicer to use operators because they're more general entities. Matrix is if you choose to represent it in one way as, as some kind of square entity. And, uh, and, and basically, the rules of this guy is that the trace of this density matrix is 1. This just says all the probabilities add up to 1. It's normalized. Uh, the second, uh, the second um, the second rule of, of this guy is that it's a Hermitian operator. So, so you get referees of papers who say, entropy, it's not uh, an observer. You can't measure entropy. Nonsense. Entropy is a function of density matrix. Density matrix is a Hermitian operator. Anything that's Hermitian is observable. And any function of anything that's observable has got to be observable, QED. Just kill the referee, OK? I've seen, I've seen reports like that. They are nonsense, OK? This guy doesn't understand quantum mechanics. 
Okay, so it's commission and it's commission. Again, for a simple reason that you can observe the frequencies with which your states occur. If I couldn't do it, I couldn't construct the density matrix in the first place. What would be the whole point of the theory that I'm using? And the final one is that it's a positive operator. And po I will tell you what a positive operator means. So this is a fancy way of writing it. But what it really translates to is basically that any inner, so the overlap with any state of this guy is, is non-negative, but it's even, it's basically equivalent to saying that all the eigenvalues are positive. And again, this is a reference to the, to the statement that not only should these guys be real numbers to be observable, but they should also be probabilities for your system to be in different states. And therefore, they have to be also positive numbers. They're not negative probabilities, unless you go into Bell's inequality. So basically, all uh, eigenvalues um, uh, are non-negative. So they are normalized here to add up to 1. And here they are non-negative. And here it just says that they are real numbers. Um, and and, and those are the, that basically defines your, your, density, your density operator. If you have anything that violates any of these rules, that's not an admissible physical state. And now you say, OK, so whatever I do to my system, has to, in the end, produce something that looks like that as well. I cannot, I cannot apply something to my system that then gives me a negative probability at the end of the process. This surely should not be an allowed physical operation. And that's actually how you define this completely positive uh, uh, map. So they're the maps that actually preserve all of these rules throughout the evolution. And the question is now, how do I write these maps down. And um, okay, so here is how, how we think about this. Again, you are thinking about the trace, the trace rule in this case. And you're thinking about what kind of combination of operators will guarantee some kind of positivity to you. And the interesting statement is that if you combine operators in this form, This would be a, an ultra-mathematical way of doing things. Then I will show physically what this means, and I think it's going to be the same thing as this. I'll show you that it's the same. And that's going to justify it, and I think it's much easier for physicists to buy this once you see the other one. But let me do the bad thing, and then I'll, I'll do the something much nicer. If you combine operators into this form, so I give you any matrix now. I multiply it by its Hermitian conjugate. And Hermitian conjugate in, 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 in Dirac notation just means that I exchange bras and cats. So the dagger of this guy is basically equal to phi times psi. And if you looked at the Hamiltonian I wrote down, then you can test that it's really a Hermitian operator. And if I exchange bras and cats, I will get exactly the same operator. That's because I wrote it down like psi 1, psi 1, plus psi 2, psi 2. And these guys are the same when I swap bras and cats. All observables are constructed like that. Again, because they have real eigenvalues. So if you combine them like that, then you can show that any expectation value is actually a positive number. So what I should be describing is I should be describing different pro experimental procedures with always operators of this type. So I could have one outcome described by this operator. I could have another outcome, or n outcomes, as many as you like. But if I write them in this way, I'm always guaranteed. I'll show you how to get something meaningful out of it, like I said. But I'm at least guaranteed to satisfy the positivity of my results. Now, what I also should do, you can also see that this is a Hermitian quantity, actually, because if I take a dagger of this guy, um, then I always get the same uh, guy back, actually. So what I really need to do is I need to sh show that all of these guys, because this is now probability to get outcome 1. This is probability to get outcome 2. This is probability to get outcome m. m. I have to sum them up, and I have to show you that they always sum up to unity. They don't overshoot the, the identity. And if I sum these guys up, you can see that the only way to achieve this 
is that when I sum up these operators, so when I do sum of ai dagger ai and I sum up i from 1 to n, this has to be identity matrix. Because then the sum of these guys just reduces to the inner product of psi with itself, and if the state is normalized, that's equal to identity. So what's the most general thing I can do to my, to my system from this lesson? So like I said, this is very, this is like, how would a mathematician think about this, and how would the mathematician comply with all the rules of quantum mechanics? And then I'll show you how this is done in practice, um, physically. How would I actually do that? How do I do this kind of, uh, this kind of measurement? Um, Um, so basically, um, if, if I take a state rho, and if I evolve it into a state that looks like the sum of these ai, rho ai dagger, under the assumption that ai dagger ai is identity over all possible life, and this could be a continu continuous as well, infinity and so on, you can integrate if you like, whatever is the, is the appropriate uh, scenario. If I do this, then I'm really guaranteed that the, that, the resulting, that the resulting map is CP map. Okay. So this state certainly is a physical state in the sense that it's, uh, that it's unit, uh, unit trace, exactly from this logic. It's Hermitian and it's also, uh, it also has positive eigenvalues. But there is this extra bit that I'm not explaining and I will have to explain, which is really the most stringent one. This is this complete. Uh, complete thing. What do I mean by complete positivity? So I'm not just saying it's positive, but it has to be completely positive. For sure positive, okay? No, no question about it. And that's, that's the kind of extra, extra bit that we need to know. So here is, here is the most general evolution. Certainly unitary transformation is a special case of that. If I didn't measure my system, but, but I just had one outcome, the deterministic evolution, Special case is that rho goes into unitary rho unitary dagger. That has this form. Okay, it's a special case. Schrodinger equation is a very special case of a completely positive trace preserving map. That's why I'm writing it in a much more serious way. Anything you do is now in this form, not just the Schrodinger equation. Um, so if you come up with a new field, you discover a new particle, you construct the Hamiltonian for your new theory, it will have to look like that, the resulting evolution. If it's not, just kill your theory, it's wrong. Providing the quantum physics is right, of course. If quantum physics is wrong, then everything is possible. So basically, that's one example. Another example is projective measurements. So if you really have a projective measurement, so projective measurement would be something that can always be written just like a state of your system. This guy happens to be Hermitian by construction. So there is, no, there is no problem about it. In this case, just A is the same as A dagger. So if you really measure project, and that's an example that I will give you just to, to get you used to, to this kind of stuff. If you really had projective measurements, then the state after projections would look like this. No need to take the dagger because it's exactly the same. Of course, projective measurements have the property that the square of this guy is the same as, as the guy itself, again. And it's very easy to see this from the Dirac notation. If you multiply psi by itself, you get exactly, you know, this psi inner product psi is 1, and you get exactly the psi guy back. Okay? So projective measurements are, are a special case of, of completely positive maps. And they're the ones that give you a definitive outcome to your questions. And what this means, that the square is the same as the projective measurement, it encodes a physical statement from the following experimental scenario. If I measure my system and I confirm that it's in a ground state, and if I measure it is instantaneously afterwards, so I do projection, another projection, I've got to get the same result as I did in the first projection. If I didn't, it would just not make any sense. Okay. It's a self-consistency requirement that a projective measurement is like this. So the second measurement has got to conform to the, unless I allow something in between to, to, uh, to occur. So this just says there is no conspiracy theory. 
broad doesn't fiddle with things between your two successive measurements. There is no cosmic conspiracy. It just makes sense. The world makes sense. Um, so that's a special case of, of a map like that. And, and certainly you can show all of these, all of these rules that apply, that apply to that. And, and, and I think a simple example, just to give you of a, of a, projective, of a projective measurement, is simply if you start in a state in a state alpha zero plus beta one, and of course if you want to write it as a proper density matrix, then you've got to then you've got to flip this. So you have to take a conjugate of these guys. And it's very easy to do that. You you, you you take complex conjugate of the numbers and you flip the brass into cats and, and vice versa. So this is your density matrix. And now what you need to do is you really, if, if you're thinking of making a measurement in the 0, 1 basis, all you are doing is really hitting this state with either projection onto the 0 state or projection onto the 1 state. And actually you do know, it's very tempting to write in the middle, but I'm, I'm so frustrated that I can't do that. Okay. Uh, Marcelo wouldn't allow me. He would have to stay forever written here. I'll wait for something really important, actually, and then <laughs> ten commandments or something. Anyhow, um, you all know that if I if I have a state alpha zero plus beta one, <coughs> and I project it onto onto zero and onto one, the language here is very wrong, and I know I've got an awful lot of students who come to me and they say, "How do you project it onto zero? Of course, I can't project it onto zero. It's a random process. I make it sound as if I can project onto zero. No, I can try to project onto this basis, and then the outcome, of course, happens with probability mod alpha squared. It's a random thing, and with mod alpha squared, you will get the state zero, and with mod beta squared, you will get a state one. And if you didn't look at the outcome, another density matrix justification, you would just combine these two outcomes like that. That would be your state after the measurement. And is that the same as this funny form here? So what I want to do now is just to show you that this really is the case. Very quick calculation. Again, I'm, I'm really guiding you by the hand and I apologize for that. So here is P. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do projection onto 0 plus projection onto 1 of your, of your state. And I want to show you that you really get this kind of outcome. I think it's probably obvious to most of you already. So basically, this guy multiplies the thing that I wrote there and, and at some stage I will get really very bored of the whole thing and I will have to start shortening my notation. So this guy is the same guy but conjugated, the, the flipped or the flipped guy. Right? Then I've got zero. This is my row. It's my density matrix. Plus projection onto one, the same state times one. Okay? And now you see that you have four possibilities here. Zero, zero. 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, okay? So let me write it for once just to, just to make it absolutely clear. So I've got four possibilities here. And I'm going to be hitting them on both sides with 0, 0. So anything that has 1 on this side is going to be killed by this 0 because 1 and 0 are orthogonal states. And vice versa here. So you can see that the only element that's going to survive is this 0 multiplied by that and this 0 multiplied by that. And from the second guy, the only thing that survives is the one element here and the one element here that has, of course, beta and beta star here. So what you really get is mod alpha squared, alpha times alpha star. These guys give you one as inner product, but this guy stays. These guys give you, give, you, give you one, but this guy stays. So this indeed is left with 0, 0 plus beta squared 1. If you can do this calculation, you can do every quantum mechanical calculation, I swear. I mean, that's as difficult as it gets. It's just you may have to do it infinitely many times. That's, of course, a little bit more difficult in a finite amount of time. Or oh, three hours of your exam, I suppose. Anyhow, so this is, this is the average. So with projections, it really nicely conforms to this rule, and it's kind of obvious that it should look like that. But now the question that you can legitimately ask is, what more can you do? I mean, isn't this all you can do in quantum mechanics? Why are you telling me that there is more to life than that? And, and the reason is the following. So now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna become a, a, a physicist, and I, I like doing that. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm gonna justify this how you would do a more general operation. Um, and a guy called Ozawa, a Japanese guy, 
um, he really hasn't received much credit for this. I think he was noticed by the, by the, by the editor of Nature then, John Maddox. This guy was fantastic. He's dead now, but he, he really was fantastic. And I think he wrote reviews about all sorts of things. He was very, very broad-minded. And I think he picked up on some of these things. So what Azama said is, he looked at these CP maps, which were initially introduced by mathematicians, and he said, what does this really mean? I mean, how do I actually convert, convert this into, into physics? And what he said is the following. He said, imagine, imagine you have your system. So now I'm going to introduce another rule of quantum mechanics in some sense, but it's not quite a rule. I mean, it's just the way we handle certain things. So what, and we'll talk much more about it, of course. What he said is, imagine I have the state of my system, but actually when I do experiments, I also have other systems around. I have ancilla systems, we call them the environment, most frequently. So he said, see, he said, I should really actually start with some state of the environment here as well. So there is an extra system, which is anything that's not the system in your lab. Could be part of the apparatus, and it really becomes semantics, how you define this. Is it part of the system or part doesn't make any difference? And what he then said is, what I can do with this guy is I can evolve it according to the Schrodinger equation, to the unitary dynamics. So here they are not entangled. This guy just means it's a tensor product thing, and it just says I've got system one and system two. That's something I'll discuss at great length, because we'll talk about entanglement as well. This tensor product is really the key thing. But for you, and actually forever, this only needs to mean that I've got two different systems which I can address independently. It's, just, it's a fancy way of writing that. It doesn't mean anything more than that. So what he said is, if I have a unitary transformation operating on both the system and environment, then I would write the evolution like that. So this now includes possible noises, other interferences from your system, maybe God interferes and whatever else interferes in nature. And, and that's it. Now, according to quantum mechanics, providing that everything in the universe obeys this, that's what we can do if you have a closed system. So presumably the universe is a closed system. And now you actually no longer care about the environment. Now I'm introducing yet another operation, which says I'm going to chase out the environment of the picture. And I'll show you how all of these things are done, because they're very important techniques. So this literally means when I do measurements ultimately, I'm never going to make a single measurement on my environment. Okay. But what it really means mathematically is sum up over all diagonal elements of your environment. It's exactly the same meaning as any other, any other trace. I'll show you how this works in a, in a minute. And amazingly enough, the evolution that you get when you do this exactly looks like this. AI row system AI dagger. That's it. So now I'm I'm not only telling you that these guys are positive operators, I'm telling you how to get them. I'm telling you how to implement them in the lab. And this was really Osawa's uh, great uh, contribution. Um, usually people talk about Krauss in this context. But Krauss is the guy who wrote down this impl implementation here. And he really didn't care about how you would do things like that. But I think we keep associate. But there is a rule in physics that every, every named thing is named in the wrong way. You are credited a wrong guy. And that's absolutely true. So, um, so that's, that's very true. So, you know, fermi golden rule is actually due to Dirac and things like that. And this is all wrong. Um, so, um, so why does this happen like that? What's the logic there? And I'll give you a very, a very quick Thing. And again, you, you will have to, you will just have to get used to these things as we go along. But all I'm going to do now is convert this trace into what it really means, and then, and then you will see how these operators come out. So trace means I'm going to trace out orthogonal states of the environment, and it doesn't matter which basis you do, you do this in. So I'm going to choose some basis from the environment. And all this formula will mean is that I'm going to sum up over some state. So now I'm, I'm translating directly what this means, ignoring the environment. It just says sum up over some orthogonal states of your environment. And the rest is just the formula that I had there. So the unitary evolution, 
state of your system, state of the environment, whatever I call it, the SIE. It could be a mixed state as well, by the way. It's easier to see it with the pure state. S plus E dagger psi I E. That's just a statement of this guy. And now you can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this guy, see this is a physicist doing mathematics, to hop across here. And I'm going to rewrite it in the way like this. Here is an inner product of one state of the environment, the unitary transformation, times psi e. That acts on the state of your system. I'm going to use the other guy to construct the other operator here. That's this guy here, which just looks like the conjugate of that guy. And indeed, it is a conjugate of that guy. S plus e psi i e. This is your a i. This is your a i dagger. And I've actually proved that they have to have that form. This is a formal proof that this is your general evolution. It's three lines. Very simple. So what is the most general thing you're allowed to do to your system? Couple it to another system and then ignore that other system. That's certainly physically allowed. You're not going to be making any mistakes there. And if you translate that into operators, you get the completely positive trace conserving error. If you take the continuous limit of this, you get the Lindblad master equation for those of you who care about things like that. That's it. That's the most general one. Um, so that's more or less uh, what I wanted to say about these things to justify them. But actually, um, uh, you, you know, if you want to, if you want to have a, a specific example of this, I think probably the best, uh, the best thing is to wait a little bit and, and get to one particular problem that's going to involve entanglement. And it's going to involve a process that's called entanglement, entanglement distillation. And then you'll see actually how much more efficient you could be if your measurements are of a more general type. So what this says is that if you allow an extra system to help you in your measurements, you will actually be able to do much better than if you don't have this extra, extra system. So that's going to be one of the nice clear examples, but I now present you what I promised initially. And I think I've got, I've got only a few minutes and I'll really squeeze this one uh, as, 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 as fast as I can. So let's go back to to the communication scenario. So Alice has this density matrix. And, and let's, for simplicity, assume, uh, assume that she really generates randomly um, two different states, psi 1 and psi, and psi, psi 0 and psi 1. And then she sends this to Bob. And Bob now, so in, in this case, p is the same as 1 minus p. She really randomly generates this. Classically speaking, this would be something that has maximum entropy. You could not compress this. But quantum mechanically speaking, and I think I'll show you that fully tomorrow, now we have everything we, we, we really need to have to, to do these things. Quantum mechanically, you can compress these things uh, much more. And it's really this quantum of von Neumann entropy that, uh, that tells you that. But the simple thing I want now is really this state discrimination. And again, this, this, is, you know, this is the way we do physics. You have someone, in this case it's Alice, preparing the system somehow. Then that someone allows the system to evolve. In this case, the evolution is trivial. I'm not doing anything, just sending it through a channel that doesn't do anything. And at the end, Bob does the measurement to discriminate what he has. And that's it. That's quantum mechanics. So now you know every bit of it, how to encode each of these guys according to the rules. That's it. There is no other question. There is no other scenario you can ever have physics. This encapsulates the whole of physics. Okay? This, is, this is really it. Um, and, and basically, so what Bob now has to do is Bob has to say, ah, okay, I know I have to have positive uh, operators because my probabilities have to be positive uh, at the output. What Bob now has to do is have two outcomes. One of them, let's call it E0, but he knows this guy has to be of this form. And the other one, let's call it outcome one, but of course he knows that he has to be of this form, and of course he knows that if he sums these guys up, that has to be everything there is to the whole game. It's either this or it's not that, which means it's something else. In this case, I only have two states. 
And then what I need to do is maximize the efficiency of discriminating these two states. So this is this famous Hellstrom problem of discriminating between two general quantum states. And this really matters now. If you, if you had a single bit, single quantum bit, if you like, channel capacity, this would be the question that you're asking yourself. And I want to just mention two things now about this. Um, it really depends on what it means to maximize your probability here. Your fitness function, if you like, could be very different depending on what you want to do. One way of doing this is just to maximize the probability of success or to minimize the probability of error. So for example, what would be the probability of error? The probability of error is that I get this outcome out, which makes me conclude that Alice sent psi 0, but actually she sent psi 1. I just screwed it up. How would I write that down? That would be the trace of E0, or A0 dagger A0, times the state psi 1. That's the other option. So the one I was talking about is basically the trace of E1 times psi 0. So what's the chance that Alice really sent state psi 1, but my measurement outcome gave me an indication that I, I have psi 0? Why can that happen? Because what she really sends is a mixture. She averages over these two outcomes. So I can always make a mistake like that. Because